Good morning, Liberty, and thank you, Johnny. I am thrilled to be here this morning, and I understand that you've had people like Donald Trump and uh, Kirk Cameron, correct? And then there's Auntie Anne. Wow. All right. Well, I am thrilled to be here today, and I'm honored that I would be able to sit here and uh, to be among these wonderful young people uh, across this auditorium. And I'm here today to share with you my story for God's glory. Uh, when I walked into the building, there was uh, a feeling of uh, God's presence is here. And uh, you know that the reason his presence is here is because you brought him with you. Is that right? Is that right? You brought God with you into this building. And the only word that I could think about when I walked into the building was just one big word that every, uh, everyone in the world understands this word, hallelujah. Can we say that all together on the count of three? One, two, three, hallelujah. Because God has done great things for you here at Liberty. I've heard about this college, and I've read about the college, but now I'm here. And what I can see and what I've heard about is that you are like a city that is set on a hill. And I believe that your purpose is to infiltrate and to influence this culture in this great country of America. And so I just want to say thank you to all of you here who on staff, the students, the faculty, who keep that purpose in the forefront of your mind to take God with you wherever you go. Now, I have to just say, excuse me for my voice. Yesterday, I could barely talk. So you may be happy about that because I won't be able to holler today. Um, so that's a good thing for you. But I'm going to do my best uh, to get to kind of squeak through this uh, if you bear with me. I just want to share what God has done for me. But before I do that, I really do need to know how many of you have had or tasted an Auntie Anne pretzel? <laughs> Oh, wow, well, wonderful. Now, there's only one problem. I, I understand you do not have an Auntie Anne's uh, on campus. So, um, maybe, maybe, Johnny, we can do something about that. Thank you, thank you. Um, you know that uh, Auntie Anne's is a modern day business miracle. And I have to tell you that God created the company. It's really true. I'm here today to encourage you in your walk with God. And I have to tell you that there have been many twists and turns in my life. I could never have imagined uh, what a simple little pretzel would do for me. It has taken me around the world and has given me the privilege of speaking at many places that I never dreamed of possible, and Liberty is one of them. And you know, Auntie Anne's pretzels, it's just a pretzel. It's just a simple little pretzel, and yet God has used that in a, in a most uh, miraculous way in my life and in the lives of many people around the world. Uh, like Johnny said, most people have no idea that I even exist. Um, I know that uh, when I sold the company seven years ago, Wikipedia stated that I died because I couldn't bear the heartache of not owning Auntie Anne's anymore. So uh, that's what uh, was announced, that I died. But I want you to know this morning, Auntie Anne, I am alive and well. God is faithful to me. He has been faithful to me from the day I was born until today. And listen, students, we have nothing to fear. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world around us. We have nothing to fear because we are serving a God who is amazing. He will take care of his children. So let's not be afraid in this craziness, in the craziness of this world. I'm called to share my story for God's glory. It started a number of years ago. I'm, I have three children. Uh, two daughters that are living on planet Earth, and then I have one daughter that lives in heaven with Jesus. I have a wonderful man that I've been married to for 44 years. I know that sounds like I might be old or something, uh, but it's true. And we have four grandchildren. Our oldest grandson is 15, and the little one is six. 
I love to share my story because the Bible, the book that all of us read and we study, is filled with stories. Stories from the very beginning of time unto the end of Revelation. It's a story book. And in the Bible, we read stories of, you know, dysfunction, disappointments, hatred, anger, families falling apart. There's all kinds of things that we read about in the Bible. There are also stories of victory, stories of redemption, and the greatest story of all, Jesus, the Son of God, coming and living among us and dying for all of our sins. It's an amazing book. And it is a storybook. So I just want to add my story to your stories. And I want to say to you today that if you have never shared your story with anyone from the beginning of time, from the beginning of what you remember as far back as you can remember to today, I want to encourage you to find somebody in your dorm or somebody that you trust or somebody that's interested in you and begin to share your story because your story is very unique to you. Nobody else has your story. I just want you to see how God showed up for me during the deepest, deepest, darkest time of my life. I call that darkness of soul. I want you to know today that with God, all things are possible. I could share with you today the success of Auntie Anne's and how it went from one farmer's market stand to over 1,200 locations today in 40, uh, 44 states and in 23 countries. Uh, that's a story in itself, and if you want to know more about that, you can pick up the book, and it has a lot of the details about Auntie Anne's in the book. But I have chosen to share with you today my greatest success. And I have to tell you that my greatest success is overcoming myself, overcoming Ann Byler. To hear of someone's success may cause you to feel inferior, but to hear of someone's struggle connects, always connects us to human suffering. There's a scripture verse in Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3, my favorite scripture in the whole Bible. It really describes what God did for me. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he gave me a firm foundation to stand on. He put a new song in my heart, a hymn of praise to God. Many will see and fear, and put their trust in him. My story for God's glory. My life was a simple life. I'm a little Amish girl from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Woo! Yes, I'm a little Amish girl from Pennsylvania with eighth grade education. Maybe I shouldn't tell you that, Johnny. Uh, but I also received my high school diploma at the age of 50. Maybe that will impress you and have received two honorary doctorate degrees. That's the extent of my, my background on education. But I can tell you all things are possible and God will use anybody for anything if we make ourselves available to him. Early on in my life, my parents taught me the value of God, family, and community. And to fear God and obey him was the order of the day. My mom always said, Anne is Jesus first, others next, and then yourself last. I heard it every day as a child growing up. Now, I know that's not very popular in our culture today. It's really all about me. It's all about taking care of me. I mean, I really deserve this, don't I? But the message of the Bible is serving others, putting them first, and putting ourselves last. I accepted Christ at the age of 12, and I had a deep love for him. I always wanted to serve him and do his bidding. I wanted to be in God's will from the time as far back as I can remember. I married my husband at the age of 19, and I really thought I struck it big that day because I married a handsome man, and I married a man that loved God more 
than he loved me. Life was full and exciting for me. I was living my dream. Growing up in the Amish uh, community, really what most girls dream about is to be a wife and a mother. And so my husband and I married and we had two children. I was living my dream. We had a storybook marriage. It was during that time that Jonas and I had a revelation of Jesus Christ in a way that was amazing. We were just completely um, hungry and thirsty for God and the things of God. And it was in that place then that we began to build a church. And my husband and I became youth pastors to around 200 young people. Life was full. Life was exciting. I thought I had arrived. At that time, I really thought that I was ready to win the whole world for Jesus because I had arrived. I had no idea that I, Ann Byler, needed to be broken and I needed to experience my own emotional and spiritual pain. My life changed in a split second. On a Monday morning, it was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. I always enjoyed singing. I heard the sound of music every day. And that morning was especially beautiful. It was a fall day. But by the time evening came around and I went to bed, Darkness had fallen. I lost the music. I began to despair. It was on that day that Angela Joy, Jesus took her home instantly. She was 19 months old. She was the life of our family. We had a four-year-old daughter at the time. She was making her trek up to Grandma's house who lived just a couple hundred feet from our place. My sister, Phi, who is here today. Phi, would you stand? You may have heard of Princess Di, but this is Sister Phi, okay? On that particular morning, my sister Phi was working for my dad, driving a bobcat, and she did not see Angie coming uh, down the lane. Angie was killed instantly. I ran to the front door of my little double-wide trailer, and I heard the screams of what was happening, but I didn't know what happened, except I felt in my heart that Angie was gone. I ran to the door, and my dad was running toward me with Angie in his arms, kept saying, Angie's dead. She's dead. I believe she's dead. Listen, folks, that took me into a world that I knew nothing about. Emotional pain, physical pain, and spiritual pain. My husband and I, who had been best friends, over time, we're not able to talk about Angie. We weren't able to talk about our feelings, so we began to just withdraw from each other. And in a few short months, our storybook marriage ended. And now we're in a marriage that was existing. There may, ha may as well have been the great wall of China between us. We could never connect again. My baby was gone. And in the process, I lost my best friend, my husband. After three or four months of grieving silently, going to church every Sunday and pretending that everything is okay. If you would ask me how I'm doing, I would say I'm doing just fine. Inside, I was falling apart. I was dying. I was not fine, and I felt bad because I thought as a Christian, I should just kind of like get over this. I should be victorious. If I prayed the right prayers and, and read the Bible enough and went to church often enough, and surely God would lift this pain, this grief, and sadness. So I went to my pastor about five months after she was killed. I went for help. And I left his office that morning, and he had seduced me. I didn't understand. I didn't know anything about sexual abuse. I didn't know anything about adulteries, affairs. I had no idea. That was just not a part of my world. So I was shocked by what happened. And I left his office, and I made a decision that day. And I want you to hear this. I decided I'm not telling anyone. I didn't know at the time but let me tell you something. What I know today is that secrets over time kill you, body, soul, and spirit. I made a decision. I'll never tell. Who would believe me? So the sadness and the grief that I was experiencing went to a whole new level. 
I stayed in that abusive relationship for six long years, the darkest years of my life. I didn't know at that time when I made that decision not to tell how sick I would become. But I want us to understand choices, always, every choice that we make has good or bad consequences. After six years of silence and being held captive in this abusive relationship, I finally told the truth to a trusted friend. To make a very long story short this morning, that was the beginning for me of overcoming. At that time, I weighed 92 pounds. I cried every day. I had backache and my knees were buckling. I'm telling you, I was breaking. I was crumbling from the inside out. You know that none of us are created to carry guilt and shame in this body for a long period of time. God created us to be free, to be open, to be people of light because that's where he lives. After sharing my story with somebody, I began to feel relief. How did I begin to live again? It was a long journey back. James 5.16 says, confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another, and you'll be healed. The, I call it the one to another confession. It will absolutely set you free. I began to practice confessing to another person. Dr. Richard Dobbins, in his, and I quote, says, Satan builds his strongholds in the secrets of our lives, and he reinforces them by silence. And when I break the silence, guess what? I break the stronghold. Yes, it's true. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> Satan builds his strongholds in the secrets of our lives, and then he reinforces them by silence. Don't tell anyone. But when I break the silence, then I break the stronghold. I love that. That is my story. I broke the silence, and I began to live. Secrets are the seedbed of Satan's strongholds, and truth is the seedbed for God to set us free. Telling the truth was the beginning of freedom for me. I lived in fear for the day when I would have to tell my husband, confess your faults one to another. <laughs> oh boy, I, I knew I was in trouble. I was not looking forward to the time. I could tell my friend, but I did not want to tell my husband. I had believed the lie that if you tell your husband, then he'll divorce you and he'll take the children from you. That day changed my life forever as well. The choice that I made to tell my husband changed my life forever. Instead of criticizing me, instead of blaming me, he loved me. I could tell you that story as well, but I can't go into that. But because he loved me and he forgave me, I'm here today because of the power of grace and one good man, my husband. I want to tell you, if you're looking for someone to marry, make sure that they love God more than they love you. I received forgiveness from my husband that day, and we started counseling. And you heard Johnny talk about the counseling that we did, and I went to work to support my husband because I loved him. He was my hero. He brought our family back together. He gave me life because he forgave me and he loved me. And out of all of this pain, we know today that our purpose was born. And that's why Auntie Anne started. I wanted to support him so that he could continue counseling. Today in Gap, Pennsylvania, we have a 55,000 square foot building that houses about 12 family services in our community. And it's because of Jonas's vision, his love for me, and his forgiveness, and Auntie Anne's that today we can minister to people every single day at the Family Center in Gap. Hallelujah. I had no idea at that time when Auntie Anne started where we were heading. The growth of the business consumed me. You have to understand, I was not a businesswoman, but I can tell you today, I am. <laughs> Listen to me, you can learn anything, really. If God calls you, he will equip you. The business consumed me and it stretched me and grew me. The book of Proverbs became my book of choice. 
And at, at the time when I thought I was able, when I was not able to go on any longer, somehow God helped me. And the verse that he gave me in Psalm 32, verse 8, he said to me, I'll instruct you, I'll teach you in the way that you should go. And let me tell you something, that's exactly what God did for me. He instructed me. I read many books, did a lot of conferences, did so many seminars about leadership and business. But mainly, I really feel like the book of Proverbs and that little verse, I'll instruct you and I'll teach you in the way that you should go, was really my strength. I remember sitting in, in the Sunday morning service and we had grown, we had about 35 stores and Jonas and I had come back from Texas during the 10 years of all this craziness in our life, we'd lived in Texas. Oh, do we have some Texans here? All right. Yeah, I love Texas. And uh, it was at that time that we both felt committed to counseling. We felt like counseling would be our ministry. And so Auntie Ann started, and we had about 35 or 40 stores, and I'm sitting in a service one Sunday morning, and I was confused. I was a little troubled because I said, Lord, did I get off track? Do you want me to help Jonas do counseling. I can't do both. Auntie Anne's is consuming me. And I'm sitting at the, on the front row of the Mission Sunday service. And I said, God, did I get off track? Am I doing what you want me to do? And I'm weeping because it's, I'm feeling the, just the pressure of, I want to do God's will. And as I was asking God, did I get off track? I all of a sudden had a picture in my mind. I saw Jesus smiling down at me and I'm rolling pretzels. It was so profound, I stopped crying and I was like, wow, what does that mean? And he spoke to me and he said, I have created Auntie Anne's as a vehicle for missions to give. And from that day to this day, I knew exactly why Auntie Anne's was in existence. It was to make money for kingdom work. God is faithful. You may not always know where you're headed or exactly what God is calling you to do, but he will be faithful. His will for me at that time consumed me. I became, compassion I became passionate about doing the work of the kingdom. And I've always called Auntie Anne's my ministry. I call it my faith walk. Sometimes I felt like if I would have known what God had up his sleeve at the beginning, I probably would never have started. And I know I think it will read stories in the Bible where Moses, do you think that Moses would have really done the work if he would have known that he was gonna be in the wilderness with complaining and whining people for 40 years? So sometimes we really don't know when God asks us to do something, what that entails. Walking by faith is really not a very secure way to live, but it is the most exciting way to live. When we do the will of God, what I have found is that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I've experienced the peace of God in some of the most troubling times in the company when I didn't know what to do. I've experienced his presence and his guidance. Nothing is impossible with God. I wanna leave you with just three points today. God can use anybody. God had a plan for me that was more difficult than I ever imagined or anticipated, and I had no idea the path would be so twisted. God used me in spite of my failure. Early on in my dark years, I really felt like God was finished with me. I felt like I was done on planet Earth and there was nothing more for me to do. That was all before Auntie Anne's. Today I know that out of my own pain, my purpose was born. And my purpose today is to host women's conferences and do classes for women to simply share their story and to help them come to the place of living a free, indeed, life. And the Bible has examples of great people, David, when God called David, he was only a shepherd boy. He was not a king. When, when God called Joseph, Joseph was not a prince. He was sold into slavery with his brothers. Moses, when, he, when God asked him to deliver the children of Israel, was not a general. 
He was running scared for his life. When God called, told Abraham that he would be a father of many nations, Abraham was childless. Listen, people, faith is what it takes to walk out and to do the will of God. We have to believe, even in spite of all the things that come against us, we must keep the faith. God's will for your life, I believe, is as simple as being called. God will call you, and then he'll lead you to your position. Number two, God can use anybody, or I'm sorry, God can use any situation. Maybe you're saying to yourself, you know, um, you know I'm, I'm done. It's just too hard. I can't go on. I am finished. But let me tell you, God is not finished with you. When you least expect it, for me, when I least expected it, God showed up. God can use every situation that you've ever experienced to make you become the person that God wants you to be. Some examples in the Bible, Peter he was a disciple of Jesus, walked with him for three years, and we know the story. He actually denied that he knew Jesus. Bad situation, but Peter became the rock of the church. Jonah said no when God specifically asked him to go to Nineveh. He took his ship and went the opposite direction. Bad situation for Jonah. But Jonah then became the evangelist for Nineveh, and the whole city was spared. I believe that God used the death of my daughter and the abuse of my pastor and put me in a place of leadership that I never thought was possible. I would never have dreamed. Number three, God can use anything. He used a simple pretzel for me to help me find my purpose. I don't know how, but God uses anything he chooses to accomplish his purposes. Many examples of that in the word of God he used the tree for Adam and Eve. He used the ark for Noah. He did the rod for Moses, the sling for David. He used the coat of many colors for Joseph. He used the donkey for Absalom, a bright light for Saul. He used a rooster for Peter, and the list goes on. God will, he can use anything to accomplish his purposes. Most of what God uses is just common, ordinary things and common, ordinary people to do extraordinary thing, things. God can use anything, so let's not limit him. In closing, what is God's will for all of us? Maybe you're sitting here today, you're in the midst of this amazing campus in this terrific, uh, faith-filled Christian school, and you may still sometimes ask the question, what is God's will for me? God may not call you to be the CEO of an international franchise company. He may not call you to to be the worship leader of a mega church. He may not call you to go to Hollywood and be a fantastic movie star. He may not even call you to be a Mother Teresa. But there's one thing that all of us in this building have in common. We were all created for one thing, and that is to carry the presence of God in our bodies every single day, every place we go. I know what it's like not to carry the presence of God in my body and what that means, the destruction that it brings in my life and the lives around me. God wants us to carry his presence. That's his purpose for all of us in this building today. When we understand that simple yet profound truth, we are absolutely a prime candidate for God to use. He created you for a purpose, a very specific purpose while you live here on planet Earth. But we also know that Satan is like a roaring lion. He runs around trying to devour us. And he also tries to steal and kill and to destroy us. And I understand what that means today. He tried to do that. And you know what? He'll do that as long as we let him. But he wants us to be people of light and be people that learn how to confess, to bring all of our deeds into the light. And when we do that, we render Satan helpless, powerless. It's the truth. It's one thing to sit by your bed or kneel by your bed or kneel by your chair and ask Jesus to help you through this problem. 
But I'm telling you, when you begin this lifestyle of confession, you get up off your knees and you go to the very person that you have offended or hurt, you'll begin to see a pathway of light and power. There is no greater joy than to walk in the will of God. And I want to encourage you today to find it. Pursue it more than anything else. Pursue the will of God and don't stop until you know that you're walking out the will of God. You will not know where he'll lead you, but you know that God is with you. Psalm 32, 8, I just want to quote that in closing. I'll instruct you and I will teach you. Now, can we think of anything that's more personal and more powerful? When I didn't have the education, the the professional experience, when I had none of that, the Word of God became my guide. I'll instruct you. And God is not kidding. (laughs) He's not kidding. He will do that for us, and he'll teach you in the way that you should go. And then he says, I'll counsel you, and I will watch over you. So I want to declare to you that God is faithful to his promises. I want to encourage you to go. Go out from this place and simply do the will of God. Carry his presence in your body at all times. And when you know his presence isn't there, then figure it out. What, who did I hurt? Who hurt me? What am I carrying in my body and why? And take those deeds and bring them into the light. You are created to fill a plan that is unique to you. And my story, for his glory, I declare to you that he'll help you, he'll strengthen you, and he'll bless you with joy unspeakable. Psalm 40, verse 1 through 3 in closing. I lost my... I waited patiently for the Lord. And he, the God of heaven, turned to me. And he heard my cries for six long years. He lifted me up out of a slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. And he set my feet upon a rock and he gave me a firm foundation to stand on. And then, as if that wasn't enough, he put a new song in my heart, a hymn of praise unto God, and many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. My story for God's glory. God is patient. He'll turn to you when you cry to him every single time. Thank you, Liberty, for allowing me to share my story today. Get the books.